Mark A., who happens to be a Frankel Institute Fellow at the University of Michigan. Um, and that's going to be on Thursday, April 4th at 7 p.m. And if you go to the jccdbt.org slash sage, you can hear more about that. Hopefully you're also getting all of our emails about all the cultural events. They actually come from my um, email, so if you don't get them, come and see any of the SAGE staff or me, and we can make sure you get onto our list to hear about all the movies, theater, books, films that we offer. It's now my pleasure to introduce tonight's special guest, Martin J. Siegel, practices and teaches law in Houston. After clerking for Judge Irving Robert Kaufman, he served as an assistant U.S. attorney in Manhattan and on the staff of the U.S. Senate Judiciary Committee. His writing has been published in the New York Times, the Los Angeles Times, the Houston Chronicle, and legal journals. He is the author of this book here, Judgment and Emergency, The Turbulent Life and Times of the Judge to Condemn the Rosenbergs. Mr. Siegel will be signing copies of Judgment and Mercy uh, in the lobby after the event. Tonight, we will also be having in conversation with Martin. We'll have Judge Michelle Apple. She's ordained, she obtained, <laughs> she obtained, <laughs> she, she had her, okay. Uh, she obtained her Juris Doctorate in Law degree from the University of Detroit. She worked at a private law firm for 20 years and served as an Open County Commissioner before being elected judge to the 45th B District Court in Oak Park in 2003. Please welcome Martin Siegel and Michelle Ash. Rosenbergs let him rot in hell. For a split second, it felt as if a bomb had detonated. 
An elderly grandee's gasped, ducked, lurched. I recovered in time to turn around and see an old, shabby figure calmly stride out of the sanctuary. The rabbi, a seasoned pro, recovered and went on. After the service, out there on Madison Avenue, two or three people were parading in a little circle holding signs, picketing in the icy cold. I was dumbstruck, protesting a dead man from the grainy gray and white yesteryear of the McCarthy era. I was 25, and to me, they might as well have been screaming, remember the Maine. I couldn't believe actual living people still cared, still hated the man enough to find and infiltrate his funeral and hound him one last time, literally into the grave. Just as Felix Frankfurter once said that being forgotten is, quote, the fate of all but very, very few judges. At least my old boss, Irving Robert Kaufman, was one of the few. In 1951, Kaufman wrangled to get the trial of Julius and Ethel Rosenberg, charged with stealing the, quote, secret of the atomic bomb and handing it to the monstrous Joseph Stalin. He was 40, one of the youngest federal judges in America and only 16 months in office. During the trial, he often intervened in ways that helped the government. Upstairs in his chambers, he conducted secret ex parte meetings with prosecutors, including the infamous Roy Cohn. No one knows what they discussed. Once jurors convicted, he deftly advertised his anguish over the sentence and alluded to solitary soul searching in his empty, dimly lit synagogue. I shall approach my task with deep humility, he'd written the president on his appointment, quote, for to judge man is almost a divine prerogative. Now the hour for judgment had come. But his lonely meditations didn't end in mercy. Instead, he condemned the young couple to die in the electric chair and Sing Sing, and blasted them for nothing less than igniting the Korean War. Quote, who knows but that millions more of innocent people may pay the price of your treason, he thundered before a spellbound Manhattan courtroom. Carried out two years later, despite a frenzied push for clemency that united Picasso and the Pope, the death sentences convulsed America and ratcheted up Cold War tensions. By then, bomb threats had driven Coffin and his family from their luxurious Park Avenue apartment. The septuagenarian zealots stalking his memorial service were missing something, then. In the years that followed the Rosenberg case, the hanging judge became something few who didn't know him predicted, a progressive stalwart. He was the first federal judge to desegregate a school north of the Mason-Dixon line. After President John F. Kennedy elevated him to the appellate bench, the United States Court of Appeals for the Second Circuit, then the second most important federal court in America, his opinions modernized the insanity defense, improved juvenile justice, reformed Attica era prisons, and shielded conscientious objectors from the jungles of Vietnam. The grateful son of immigrants, he freed the, quote, man without a country stranded on Ellis Island and haltered Richard Nixon's deportation of John Lennon on bogus drug charges. In a decision called the Brown versus Board of Education of Human Rights Law, he breathed life into a vague, dusty statute from 1789 and permitted victims to bring their foreign torturers to justice in American courtrooms. His greatest mark was on the First Amendment, as he championed the press and free speech in the Pentagon Papers case, a landmark libel suit against 60 Minutes, and other path-breaking decisions. Again and again, civil liberties lawyers would think of the martyred Rosenbergs and Blanche on learning Kaufman was one of the three judges assigned to decide their appeal, only to turn ecstatic when he ruled in their favor. Grace with help from the Rosenbergs overflowed toward others, the weak, the excluded, the unpopular. So the fierce living passion aroused that day by the old, dead Irving Kaufman poses a riddle about judicial schizophrenia. How did the man responsible for two of the most infamous executions in American history become one of the most illustrious liberal jurists of his time? The question is what two historians call the, quote, enigma of the Rosenberg's judge, a figure typically but wrongly caricatured as nothing more than a minor, bloodthirsty, supporting cast member in the morality play of McCarthyism. Kaufman's clamorous send-off also reflected the wages of an extraordinarily tumultuous judicial life one produced by a superheated energy and a frantic ambition. Quote, my entire career has been one dominated by a sense of urgency, he confided to a family member. In his first four decades, he rose from nothing to national hero. Most people thought the Rosenbergs got what they deserved, and newspapers and congressmen hailed his courage in defying communist looking and lunatic death threats. Little seemed to block his path to the, quote, Jewish seat on the Supreme Court. But gradually, over the second 40 years, the terror of atomic annihilation and the red baiting dissipated. 
and a deferred and scornful howl went up over what had happened to the Rosenbergs. In the 1970s, the couple's orphan sons came of age and led a new generation's crusade to expose the government's asserted, quote, frame-up of their parents. Charges made all too plausible by the stream of official lies in Vietnam and Watergate. When FBI records revealed Kaufman's private dealings with the prosecution, it was suddenly 1953 again. Dogged by new threats and strident protesters, denounced in print and faced with calls for impeachment, he lived under siege. His haunting by the eternally young couple bubbled to the surface in defensive outbursts to people he hardly knew, and in a relentless, decades-long secret campaign to counter and muzzle critics. I saw it in the sad, creased, oxidized brown index cards I found on his desk in 1991, quoting praise from the Rosenberg's lawyer almost half a century earlier. Life in this pressure cooker exacted its bitter toll. One of Kaufman's sons was in the synagogue that morning to say farewell, but two were absent. They predeceased Kaufman after decades of substance abuse, paternal haranguing, and in one case, mental illness. Dominated by the husband she married at 19, Kaufman's wife Helen suffered her own travails, alcoholism, anorexia, and attempted suicide. Misery shadowed the family's gilded lives among New York's Jewish elite, Few in the know chalked it up to coincidence. For most to do it, judging offers one of life's quieter, cloistered pursuits. By and large, judges lead unspectacular lives, wrote one profiler with a revered judge learned hand in 1946. Quote, their careers, like broad plateaus, were unmarked by gullies and hills. For Kaufman, however, the judicial calling formed a backdrop to heartache and collateral damage. What began as dazzling and precocious self-made success, a sprint toward the summit of legal power ended largely in self-inflicted tragedy, just as the letter writers and funeral pickers wanted. Despite judges' importance, our system seeks to anonymize them, from uniform black robes to delicate pronouncements and legalese. Yet temperament and inner life are among the key forces that contribute to judicial outcomes, though almost all the attention usually goes to ideology or political background. As one legal philosopher said famously long ago, quote, there is no guarantee of justice except the personality of the judge. Or as Kaufman himself put it, quote, justice is administered by human beings. And Kaufman the man defiantly refused to recede into bureaucratic obscurity. Judges, usually, especially appellate ones, are usually thought of as reactive, dispassionate, reserved, Olympian, contemplative. For better and worse, Kaufman was the opposite, active, hyper-energetic, combative, consumed with energy, power hungry. At a bantamweight five feet four inches, he disappeared into his leatherback chair, leaving a head barely visible above the bench. His deep, loud, gravelly, heavily accented New York voice had to do the work, and it never failed to make itself heard. The court, the fleshy face with its broad and mashed up nose and curled down lower lip, often formed what Roy Cohn called the quote, intimidating leader. Until Gray emerged victorious in his 60s, his hair was thick and black and slipped back. He placed great stock in appearances, looking British and thinking Yiddish, and his dark three-piece suit was always well tailored with cufflinks and pocket square. To those squirming under his thumb, clerks, secretaries, lawyers who didn't measure up, he was tyrannical, a grenade waiting to explode. One ex-clerk I called said simply, that was the worst year of my life and I don't want to talk about it. Another cried in the bathroom so often that when Kaufman learned where she was, he decided she must be drinking too much water and ordered it banned from chambers. <laughs> As for her co-clerk, Kaufman raised himself up on tiptoes and shouted in his face so rapidly that the clerk thought to himself, I think I'm going to hit this guy, and wondered if that was a federal crime. That was when Kaufman was 80, after a triple bypass and a year from death. Before I even started, I heard about the time he got a call from security downstairs, after which he quietly put on his coat and left the office. A few minutes later, a marshal called back and was astonished that one of the clerks picked up the phone. Didn't the judge tell you about the bomb threat? The man asked. Of course he had. Kaufman had wanted them to keep grinding. Was the story true? Who knows? The point is it was believable. Quote, fundamentally, he was not a nice person, an earlier clerk acknowledged. Yet Dr. Jekyll was there too, always. Friends and peers, he was affectionate and dependable. A few clerks adroitly navigated the tantrums and emerged close confidants with a powerful and eager backer in their corner. 
His eye can twinkle as he charm listeners with jokes delivered with, quote, the polish of a Catskills comedian, as one former group put it. Gregarious and charismatic when he thought it was worth the effort, he could and did seize the spotlight in rooms full of more prominent people. In 1977, a reporter signed a profile call and found herself defeated and eventually gave up, telling her editor, quote, I could not come to terms with all the ambivalent feelings Irving Kaufman provoked. A man with a devouring passion for publicity, and one who also calls up a kind of sympathy for the raw nerves, the warmth that are also a part of him. This is the stuff from which novels are made, not Times Magazine pieces, end quote. Or as one anonymous lawyer summarized Kaufman for a guide to the federal judiciary, He's courageous, outspoken, opinionated, articulate, usually right, and not much loved. Memoranda between judges of the Second Circuit were addressed to recipients using their initials. Kaufman was IRK, IRK. <laughs> Everyone agreed it fit him perfectly. one of these phases which uh, you guys some of you were writers you know we're all kind of told encouraged to do this where I was going to wake up at five in the morning and I was going to pound out you know 500 words and then I would go to work I had little kids then and, and like that just did not work that lasted for about six weeks gave that up um, but I did work over the years and, and got pretty you know got into it but I did I found a point in 2016 where I just I had to decide I was not I was either going to write this book and finish it um, or not. I was not going to be able to do that while continuing to work. So I took a little sabbatical from work for a few years and finished the book. Um, so in a way, 30 years, in another way, three or four years. So what's interesting also, if you go through the footnotes, the research he's done is remarkable. And the archives he worked with and the family relationships um, yeah. he established in order to write this book, I thought was really interesting. And I think his early life would really resonate with you know, this Jewish crowd and what kind of life he had. It took him from the Lower East Side to Park Hill. Sure, well, he, he had one of these like fantastic, you know, <laughs> incredibly rapid rises, um, starting from nothing. And it, it's the classic story that we all 
hear about um, in New York, although of course it happened in lots of other places too. Um, but uh, Lower East Side, his family arrived in America a few years before he was born. Um, he, his first five, six, seven years was on the Lower East Side. Um, then they went up to Jewish Harlem. Um, there's a family story that's passed down now, even in the third, fourth generation or so, after it supposedly happened, where the mom sat uh, Judge Kaufman and his brothers down and, and looked at the eldest and said, you're gonna be a doctor, and looked at the middle one and said, you're gonna be a dentist, and then came to the youngest and said, you like to talk, so you're gonna be a lawyer. Um, and what's crazy is they did become doctor, dentist, and lawyer. Um, so Judge Kaufman was always first doing things. He was out of high school at 16. He was out of law school at 21 before he was even old enough to take the bar. Um, and I, I know, as many of you would know, um, the classic thing to do in that era in the 20s and 30s when you're Jewish and you're in New York and you want um, an education and you have no money is to go to CCNY. Um, which I learned in the course of doing this, the nickname then was Circumcised Citizens of New York. I did not heard that before. Um, and that's the one sense in which actually Judge Kaufman's early life deviated. Um, he went instead to Fordham, and he went to Fordham because his older brother had gone to Fordham, and his older brother had gone to Fordham as a doctor because his older brother was afraid that if he went to CCNY, he would appear in medical school to just be like another Jewish kid applying to medical school. CCNY, so he wanted to distinguish himself, he went to Fordham, he liked it, and Irving Kaufman went to Fordham too, but, but there's a little bit of a wrinkle because Fordham in that day and age, up in the Bronx, um, was a really insular kind of place. Most of the student body, almost all of the student body really was Irish Catholic, um, and that's not where Kaufman went. Um, Kaufman went to a newer program that Fordham had established downtown in the Woolworth building, Right, up, right by the courthouses and city hall and right kind of in the thick of things at Fordham, it was called Downtown Fordham, and Fordham set this program up precisely to appeal to all these new New Yorkers, all the immigrants, there, were, there was night school, there were a lot of women. Um, in World War I, especially with men gone, they opened it up to women, there were, there were black students. So it was a, it was a kind of an unusual microcosm of the city. Um, there was an unusual microcosm uh, of the city in, in Fordham, unusual for Fordham, because that's not what the rest of Fordham was like. Um, and then he was out and became a lawyer, and the thing that was really responsible for his rise, um, and this is tr true today as it, as it was then, and has been true in the interim, uh, if you're a young lawyer and you want experience and you want to make a name for yourself and get yourself in the papers, um, there's no better way to do that than to be a crusading prosecutor, and that's sort of the next phase of his life. Um, he did go to private practice, he did, that's right. I and married the bosses. He did. That's a classic deal, married the boss's daughter. So yeah. he, he yeah. did that classic That's true, too. but only for two years or so, yeah, that's right. So let's skip ahead a little bit, and you talk about going into the prosecutor's office. So that sort of established a lot of his political views. It also led to how he handled the Rosenberg trial. So yes. maybe talk about how he that experience showed up in the Rosenberg trial. Sure, I, I will. Well, so the, the, maybe the downside of, of making your name as a prosecutor, and that's what everybody knows you for, and that's what catapults you into the upper echelons of law in New York, and sets you up for a judgeship. Um, it's possible that the downside for that is you, you think of yourself, you, you, have a, you tend to view law enforcement pretty fondly. Uh, you're, and he was sort of a creature of law enforcement. Um, and more than just he'd been a prosecutor, he became, um, well, J. Edgar Hoover became a mentor to him. Um, and Kaufman very much, that was an accidental Kaufman, very much cultivated Hoover, even though he had no interaction with him as a prosecutor. And he started writing him in Washington, and he had interaction with other people in the FBI, which was sort of very new then. Um, and Hoover was in the early years of his long administration of the FBI. Um, and Hoover became a kind of mentor to him, and of course that was a valuable help as he wanted a federal appointment. Uh, the other person in law enforcement who became a real um, figure for him, who, who helped his career, was Tom Clark, um, who had worked his way up in the Justice Department, um, and by the Truman administration was Attorney General, um, and would later be on the Supreme Court. So again, uh, you, you can't really do, if you want to be a federal district judge, you can't really do any better than you're being helped in that regard by the head of the FBI and the Attorney General. It doesn't really get any better than that. And he became a judge um, at 
age 39, um, only the second youngest at that time in America. But, but there's a problem there too, um, which is you, you, the younger you are as a judge, and we see this a lot today, because now there's a, there's a real effort now, I think more then, uh, more now than then for partisan reasons to place people on the bench um, at a very young age so that they'll have 40, 50 years on the court. Um, and the problem, a problem there potentially anyway, is you don't have a lot of seasoning. Um, and for Kaufman, although he spent most of the 40s in private practice, um, he, he still, I think when he took the bench, saw himself as a government guy, basically. So did they give up your trials? <laughs> well, uh, no. Well, I guess what I say in the book is, is no and yes. Um, and and I'll, I'll, I'll start with the yes first. The, the yes in the sense that, um, the instructions to the jury were fair. Yes, in the sense that they had counsel. Their, their counsel was not very good, um, but that wasn't really Judge Kaufman's fault exactly. Their, their counsel were um, not really seasoned criminal defense lawyers, but they were lawyers identified by the Communist Party. Um, and, and they were clearly out of their depth trying to represent these people accused of atomic espionage, but very few people knew even what that meant. Um, one of their, one of the junior lawyers on their team said that they were trying to understand the government's evidence, and the government in criminal cases is not really required to tell you all that much about its evidence, which is different from civil cases, weirdly. Um, and, but what little they knew about the case, they were trying to understand these components of the atomic bomb, and they went and talked to physicists, and no one would talk to them, because it's 19, 50 and 1951, and they want, people want no association whatsoever with these communist spies who were on trial for their lives. So they, it, partially because of their lack of experience in criminal cases and partially because of the times, the, the lawyers were not very good. Uh, but that's not, that wasn't Judge Kaufman's fault either. Um, it was a fair trial, or at least um, a, a result that's explicable by the evidence, I would say, in the sense that the government's case against them was quite powerful. Um, and it, it wasn't the main witness against them, as you guys know, you were familiar with the case, was Ethel's brother, um, David Greenglass, um, who was part of this conspiracy. He had been at Los Alamos. He uh, was a machinist, a very low-level functionary, sort of at Los Alamos, but he'd learned some information about the bomb, and he came back with a sketch uh, of one of the components, the lens mold. Um, and Julius Rosenberg acquired other information about other military secrets from other sources. David wasn't his only source. Um, but Greenglass wasn't the only witness at trial, although he was a convincing one. Um, there were other people that Julius had dealt with as a spy. Um, there were minor witnesses who had nothing to do with espionage or, or any of this, really, but they were persuasive to the jury because they seemed to be unbiased. A, a, a good example of that is the passport uh, a, a photographer at the base of the courthouse there took passport photos came in and testified that the Rosenbergs had come with their young children to take passport photos, um, claiming to be on the verge of a vacation. Um, but the government had other evidence that they intended to flee to Mexico. Um, and in fact, one of their co-defendants did flee to Mexico and was apprehended there and brought back to the US for trial. So there were, the, the case against them was strong. Um, and especially given the temper of the times, it's unlikely the Rosenbergs were going to be acquitted really in any scenario. Having said all that, that, that's all the yes part of why it was a fair trial. There is a no part, um, and the no part is twofold. If, if you read the transcript, what will immediately come across to you is how often Judge Kaufman is speaking. Um, a, a judge is, typically we think of a judge, he sits back, he rules on objections, he doesn't do very much really. The trial is carried out by the lawyers and the witnesses. Um, judge Kaufman interjected all the time in the questioning, um, at critical moments too. And he almost always did that, as I said in the prologue, to reinforce the case of the prosecution. Um, for example, uh, there was a moment where, really the key moment against Ethel, where David Greenglass, her brother, testified that she was typing up the notes that he had brought back and handwritten from Los Alamos so that the Russians would understand what he was saying and make it legible um, to their handlers. Um, and when he gave that testimony, Judge Kaufman immediately interrupted and had him repeat it for the jury, just to sort of reinforce it, to make it clear the jurors understood. And that appears throughout the transcript. Um, now having said that, the, the Rosenbergs did make that a key feature of their appeal, and nobody, not on the Supreme Court, not on the Intermediate Court of Appeals, was persuaded that, that that was enough to overturn the verdict. 
because the judge does get a lot of latitude in terms of how they run the trial. But if you read it, 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 it reads to me like he's fairly biased. But more important, the second thing more important than that is, as I said in the prologue, he had these secret, what are called ex parte conversations with the prosecution, which you're not supposed to do. All do you? Yeah, uh, every day, after, supposedly every day after the testimony. Um, um, you know, the, the rules are that a judge is only uh, present before the parties and the lawyers on both sides for, for all the obvious reasons. Um, he was conducting these kind of back channel conversations with the prosecution and it's impossible now to know what they talked about. It could have been sort of harmless logistics of trial, what's coming up next, what's the evidence, who are the witnesses, that sort of thing. Um, or it could have been much more serious. We, we, we know about it because of Roy Cohn's Roy Cohn denied that for decades. Um, there were rumors of it, and then it, it was hinted at in these FBI documents that became public in the 70s. Um, Roy Cohn kept denying it, and right before he died in 1986, I think it was, in an autobiography, he admitted that it happened. I interviewed Judge Kaufman's law clerk um, at, during the Rosenberg trial, and he told me that it happened as well. He's someone who got his job, actually, because he'd been a friend of Roy Cohn at Columbia Law School. Um, so he told me that it happened. So, um, Did you see the association? Yes. Roy Edgar Hoover, Roy Cohn. Right, exactly. So, so long answer, I'm sorry, but, but that's, that's the, the trial. I think, I think had those conversations not happened, and had, had Judge Kaufman not intervened in the questioning, I think they would have been convicted anyway. Um, but that doesn't mean that that was proper behavior. But then there's the sentence. How do you explain yeah. it? Do you explain it politically? Do you explain it Jewishly? Do you explain it, um, you know, the ties to McCarthy? All the things that were going on. My, my piece, I'm sorry. So then we get to the sentence. And so we all know what the sentence is, and so Let's even assume that the trial of Stan, you know, stands up to review and that the appellate process was appropriate in the conviction. But then we get to the sentence that he could have sent them to jail yes. or prison for 30 years. He did not have to impose the death penalty. And then even in the context of how he behaves later in life, where he's so pro-individual life and so pro-civil liberties, how do you explain it? Was it his fear of being um, provoking anti-Semitic response? Was it his um, fear of McCarthyism? Was it his political affiliation? What explains how he chose to sentence the rules? Right, so, so I think it's maybe an easy answer, but I think it's all of the, all of the above. <laughs> I, I, think, I think some of everything you've been, yeah, it's all right, right, I, you're a judge, so yeah, I have to agree with you, you know, as a lawyer. Um, um, I think it's a little bit of everything, um, and so let me just go through some of those. He, he was, as a protege of J. Edgar Hoover, and as a product of Fordham, like Fordham, which was a, a conservative, just despite, you know, the, it's diverse and growing a new student body at this, this you know, institution they set up downtown. It was still a conservative place in the sense of the instruction um, and the, the kind of ideology um, at a time when, in the 1920s, they're starting to comment on communism and how it's a danger to the United States. That was very prevalent at Fordham, actually, then. Um, and then he's, then he's a kind of creature of Hoover. So he, he was a little more, even than I think you might find typically in a federal judge in that era, um, fiercely anti-communist. I think that's part of it. Um, part of it, I think, is sheer personal ambition. He wanted that case. He arranged the appointment um, to it. Um, he, I think he looked primarily at another prominent case that had been conducted in that same courthouse a couple of years earlier of the leaders of the American Communist Party. Um, there, a judge who ran that trial, a guy named Harold Medina, had really been sort of lionized as a national hero. He'd been quickly promoted. He also had handed out the stiffest possible sentences, although they were, it wasn't the death sentence for that. Um, so I think, I think to some degree that motivated him as well. Um, but to me, to really, in really sort of drilling into this, and of course it's all kind of amateur armchair psychology, right? But, but in, in drilling into this, what really strikes me, I think, is how he saw the Rosenbergs. How would he have looked at the Rosenbergs? The Rosenbergs 
were very much like him. You know, they, they were all second generation, poor Jewish New York, similar, Julius Rosenberg grew up in Harlem, um, Jewish Harlem, similar kind of places where they started. Um, but Kaufman uh, was a real creature and success story, the kind of American success story. He embodied that and he believed in that deeply. He's not someone who had to kind of like fake it <laughs> for, for an appointment or for political purposes. He, it was bone deep with him. And I think when he saw the Rosenbergs and what they did, to him it was a betrayal not just of the United States, but a sort of betrayal of, almost of him and what he stood for. And I think he, he this comes across to some degree in his sentencing remarks um, when he sentenced them in 1951, but the case came back to him around Christmas time of 1952 because the rules at that time required the Rosenbergs, there was only one person who could change the sentence, including the Supreme Court had almost no latitude over sentences under federal law at that time. Um, so really, the place they had to go after they exhausted their initial appeals just to get a reduction in the sentence was, unfortunately for them, back to Judge Kaufman. The last one. They tried, well sure, that's a separate, they, they tried clemency, yeah. That's right, right, that, that should be pointed out. They tried both with President Truman and then with the new Eisenhower administration to get uh, commutation of the Senate. That's a, aside from the judicial process and both presidents declined to do that. Uh, but in the legal system, their only place to go ultimately was Judge Kaufman. So they went back to him and had a proceeding and wrote briefs and had an argument in court and argued for a lower sentence. And this time Judge Kaufman wrote had occasion to write a, a written opinion. Um, and this is what he said, I think it really kind of summarizes how he viewed them in the, this kind of special, uniquely personal way he took this. He said, quote, the defendants were born in America, reared in America, and educated in the public schools of America. They had lived their entire lives among us. They had all the advantages of our free institutions and had enjoyed the, had enjoyed the privileges of American citizenship. Yet they chose the path of traitors and decided to abandon those who had nurtured and fed them in favor of a nation whose ideology was repugnant to everything we have learned, lived for, and to which we have been dedicated. They knew well that the stakes were high and the consequences of failure were dire. So that riff about born here, educated here, we cared for them, I think he, I think that's him and his background talking. You know, that's, that's how he saw this, I think. Uh, one other, if I can, one other snippet I will read is a letter. This is a card I came across written by uh, Kaufman's wife um, right around that same time, right before the execution in 1952. Um, and, you know, he's under, originally the sentences were very popular. They took a poll. The, the vast majority of people thought those sentences were fair. Um, and there was, there was very little outcry. Um, but in the, the almost two years, um, in between, or over two years, in between the trial and the execution, there was some opposition that grew, uh, such that by the time of the executions, there was a sort of worldwide move for clemency. Um, marches in major cities, certainly in New York and D.C., and really around the world. So this movement grew, and, and Judge Kaufman began to be, as you'd expect, the sort of object of this, this campaign. So while that was happening, and this case was back in front of him, his wife wrote him a little note. And she said, Irving Deer, don't let the commies get you down. Keep remembering they are trying to undermine the safety of our country. Where can we go from here? Be strong and just roll with the punches. We all love and admire you. That idea of where can we go from here, that really hit me. Like, these are, these are Jews, <laughs> and, they, and they're in America, and they're grateful, and Judge Kaufman is grateful for what's, you know, his station and his, his rapid rise and his prosperity, and he knew there was nowhere else to go. Um, and I think, it's, I think that letter reveals a lot of the thinking. But it's this case that almost ruins the rest of his life. Yeah. Because yeah. as you heard him describe, the cases he decided over the rest of his life are admirable and changed jurisprudence into, depending on your politics, you know, he really, did play both sides of the aisle, but ultimately did a lot of work that was in favor of personal liberties and civil rights, and he never really got the COVID that yeah. should have come from that work. So maybe if we respond to that, then maybe we can open it up for some questions. Right. Well, so so the, the, he did have this illustrious 
later liberal career. Um, and it was, it was never enough to sort of cleanse the stain of the Rosenberg case uh, among his critics. And so the knock on Judge Kaufman for all those decades later was the, exp the supposed explanation for his, his liberal leanings and his progressive rulings was he, this is atonement. He just wants atonement. Um, and there were, there were a couple of versions of that kind of case against him. One, one was the cynical version, which was he doesn't even really care. He doesn't think he needs atonement. He doesn't care about atonement. He just, what he really wants is to stay in the good graces of his liberal friends on the Upper East Side and the New York Times. And he was very close to the New York Times. He was friends with the publisher, um, friends with the managing editor. He was, he was covered elaborately in the New York Times. Got, got much more press than other judges. Other, some other judges were sometimes jealous of that. Um, he wrote articles for the Times. This kind of special relationship with the Times. Um, and so the, the thinking was, well, he's, he's just kind of doing this to preserve his status. Um, I, I don't really think that's true. Um, I, to me, and maybe any, anyone, any biographer, I think, you know, might think this, you, you, you want to look for, what about something deeper than that, and kind of like deeper explanation. And, and for me, the later liberalism is consistent with this, this early background of Stryber, who is succeeding in this city that's open to everybody in this educational system, both public and then when he gets to Florida, that's open to everybody um, in this, this government that rewards his performance with honors and the system in which he earns substantial wealth. Um, and uh, I, I think it was sort of there all along. Yeah, so those cases ranged from, there were cases in prison reform, there were cases in his First Amendment cases, he was on the right side, or at least what the Supreme Court said was the right side of the Pentagon Papers case. Right, um, he liberalized conscientious objection um, so that it was open not just to people with religious objection, but also moral objection. If you actually read the statute at that time, it's a, <laughs> it's a stretch, <laughs> uh, but, but yeah, exactly right. Um, he, there were, um, high school teachers who were fired for their jobs for wearing an armband in one case during the Vietnam War, or in another case for refusing to say the pledge, he had them reinstated. He changed the insanity defense. Maybe his most important ruling, um, which I alluded to there in the prologue, um, involves this, a law from 1789 which opens American courts to um, people who have been the victim of human rights abuses anywhere in the world um, if they're defendant happens to be in the United States. That was a, a truly landmark ruling that, that, in a way, is credited with kicking off almost a revolution in international human rights law, not just in the United States. Um, in that case, and in many of the others we're talking about, the more, supreme, more conservative Supreme Courts that have come along in the 1970s and really just getting farther and farther right since then have cut back on a lot of these um, and um, reversed some and kind of hollowed out others. Um, so in that way, his legacy, you know, as with any liberal judge of that era, his legacy isn't as powerful as it was immediately. Um, but um, it, it, was a, it was a consequential career, but to everybody, his, his greatest fear was that he would be known only for the Rosenberg case. In his obituary in the New York Times, it quotes a clerk who said that Kaufman told him I know that the Rosenbergs are going to be the thrust of my obituary, and it's going to be in the title of my obituary. He was bitter about that. Um, so he, he never did escape it. And, and as I also said in the prologue, it, it really corroded his what became a kind of tragic family life. So, maybe some questions? Okay, wait, before we start the questions, oh, because the mic is attached to a cord, I'll go around and I'll repeat the question because I have a very loud voice and hopefully that way everybody will hear the question. What's your thinking? You know, alleged that Ethel was innocent and they uh, wanted to uh, put her on trial, especially Julius. Yeah, sure. So, so the question is, is it's, you, you said it's been said or alleged that Ethel was actually innocent and that, that she was put on trial really to pressure Julius into confessing. Um, starting with the first part of that, whether she's innocent, um, we know now that Julius was guilty, was a member of the Soviet espionage operation in the United States. We know that because the U.S. had broken the Soviet wartime code in something, that, an effort that was called Project Venona. Um, 
And so Julius was identified, uh, his, his code name, if I'm remembering correctly, is liberal, uh, was his code name. Um, but it was very fragmentary as to whether Ethel was involved. In fact, there was a, a mention that says Ethel knows, but does, knows of her husband's work, but doesn't work herself. Um, so we don't, to this day, we don't really know if Ethel did anything. And of course, there wouldn't have been much for her to do, you know, like, because they, they wrote out of those Alamos, the, the information from those Alamos came from Green Glass and well, some other military information from others. Um, it seems clear that she knew. She, she was a, both of them were pretty committed communists. It seems clear that, it seems believable that she would have supported it. She certainly had the opportunity to, as the government hoped, to confess. Um, and the, the hope was that she would confess in order to not orphan her two children. She refused to do that. Um, and yeah, it, it, the other part of your question was, was she charged, in essence, to pressure Julius into confessing? And I, the evidence for that is strong. Um, there was a the government official who tested, essentially said that to the Atomic Energy Commission in a closed session before the trial. Um, that's likely. Um, when they were executed, uh, shortly after they were executed, um, well, I, I take that back. This was someone who was involved in the efforts to get them to confess before they were executed. He, he said this much later when he was interviewed by a New York Times reporter named Sam Roberts. Um, and this was someone who was high up in the, both the Justice Department and the ADC. And what he said about both Rosenbergs is, they called our bluff. The, the hope was they would confess, um, and they didn't. So, the rule that the government, you know, did the government disclose this information from the Venona project at trial? Um, and the answer is no. They, they very much kept it. They did not want to disclose it at trial. They needed to keep this fact secret. You can imagine how critically secret it, it was. Um, so they, they did not disclose that at trial. Um, I think the rest of your question was, is that part of what they were talking about um, with the prosecution? And there's no way to know. Roy Cohn later said that he told Judge, that Roy Cohn later said two things, that he knew about these transcripts, the Venona transcripts, and that he told Judge Kaufman before the trial. Again, it's, it, there's no way to know whether that's true. It's, it's highly unlikely that Roy Cohn, that that information would have been disclosed to Roy Cohn. Roy Cohn had all of these political connections. Um, his father was a politico in New York. He, that's how he got this job with McCarthy at 23 or something. Um, so Roy Cohn was more powerful than the typical junior prosecutor, but it's, that secret was so closely guarded, and the FBI didn't trust Roy Cohn, that it's unlikely that Roy Cohn knew that. Um, it is reflected in FBI records that the FBI went to Judge Kaufman after the trial, after, sorry, after their executions in 1953, in order to put his mind at ease, and told him that the government had had information to see, of proving their guilt too secret to reveal at the trial. Um, and Judge Kaufman is quoted as saying something like, I suspected as much. But again, I don't think even Judge Kaufman was told the nature of that. I'm sure he was not told that they broke the Soviet's code. Um, but he was told, we had information, we couldn't release it at trial. Don't worry, they, they really were guilty. Um, so. Well, so, so uh, he believed, he hoped and believed it was in his future. Um, he certainly, he's the, he's the kind of person, if I haven't conveyed it well enough yet, the, the book goes into it at length, he, he's the kind of person who didn't sit around and wait for opportunities. He tried to make his own luck and his own success. He lobbied furiously uh, for an appointment. He lobbied, and first he had to lobby to get himself on the appellate court, which he set about to almost immediately after the trial. And because of the trial, he had, he had bi unusual bipartisan support, so he wasn't a typical Democrat. There were hardcore anti-communist 
Republicans in Congress who especially wanted to stick up for him because they'd seen he'd been under pressure and he'd been threatened. Stiles Bridges was one from, I think, from Connecticut, if I'm remembering that correctly. He was a senator who was in his corner. Um, and some others as well. And, but he also had New York Jewish support and he had Democratic support around the country. So he, he had what we now call juice uh, politically. Um, and he used that and got himself put on the Court of Appeals fairly quickly. Um, and his best chance at the Supreme Court was early in the Kennedy administration. And Kennedy had a couple of appointments. Um, and Kaufman promoted himself, but um, there is, and, and there was, even in the Kennedy administration at that time, they were still, they were thinking about the Jewish seat. They were thinking, the Jewish seat started to feel anachronistic. <laughs> like, do we need this, do we really need this anymore? Um, and some of the advice that went to President Kennedy is we don't have to think in these terms exactly anymore. We don't really need it. We just treat Jewish Americans like anybody else. Um, but as it happened, Ar Arthur Goldberg was Jewish and Kennedy wanted to put Goldberg on the court. Um, so they, the Jewish seat lived on for a few more years. Uh, Kaufman didn't get that appointment. And to the degree I was able to dig into this in the presidential libraries of the Kennedy administration and the Johnson administration and even the Nixon administration, because again, Kaufman hoped that as a crusading communist in the 40s and 50s, Nixon would kind of look fav might look favorably upon it. He never got very close. Um, and he did, I think the reason he didn't get very close is because, aside from the controversy in the Rosenberg case, which was less controversial then, is that he, he just was not, he was seen as a mover and a shaker and extremely active and somebody who you know, had his fingers in lots of different areas of law, but he was not seen necessarily as intellectually preeminent. Um, there was another judge who beat him to the Court of Appeals who he served with, a guy named Henry Friendly, who's, Name isn't widely known, but, but well-known among lawyers then. Um, and Friendly was seen, also Jewish, and Friendly was seen as the sort of brighter light, scholastically and, and intellectually. Um, friendly had clerked for Brandeis. And, um, well, the members of the Supreme Court were in the early 2000s. Yes, right, well that's true, although, so, so one of those early seats in the Kennedy administration was, was Felix Frankfurter, Felix Frankfurter died. Um, and Frankfurter had, uh, in a letter to Learned Hand, Frankfurter despised Kaufman's self-promotion. Frankfurt was someone who, who revered the judiciary as an institution, and he thought that people angling for appointments, even to these lower courts, was unseemly. And the Second Circuit had this great, this sort of outsized reputation then, really as the second most preeminent court in America. And some people thought some of their judges, like Learned Hand, were better than those on the Supreme Court, and there were some others too. Um, and Frankfurt just despised Kaufman's kind of hustling for it, and he despised the fact that Kaufman let it be known before the Rosenbergs were sentenced that, as I said in the prologue, he was meditating alone in a synagogue. So Frankfurter wrote a letter to Learned Hand, and he says, I'm mean enough and old enough, no, sorry, I'm mean enough to stay here long enough so that, I, that Kaufman will be too old to succeed me. Um, and he says, I, I despise a judge who told him, who says that God told him to impose a death sentence. So Kaufman handed it, but, but then Frankfurter was gone. So <laughs> Frankfurter couldn't prevent it. No, so the Rosenbergs never set foot in New Mexico. That the person who was there was Ethel's brother, um, a guy named David Green, her younger brother, David Greenglass. He was a machinist. At Los Alamos. He had a sort of inadequate, barely sufficient technical education. Um, he, he was not anywhere near the, the true, like, theoretical work that was done there. But he, he you know, got the necessary access to some of the information um, that, that was secret and did prove to have some utility um, in the Soviet development of the bomb. Um, so and he, that was brought back to Manhattan through a courier named Harry Gold. Who went out there? Who was, who was also prosecuted? One of the first people uh, prosecuted and confessed and sentenced to jail. It was her brother that sentenced her. Yeah. Ethel, and it implicated Ethel. Right, right. Greenglass was the key witness really against both of them at trial, but especially Ethel. Yeah. Right. Yep. Ever offered Ethel a chance to confess or to plead guilty? Yeah. So, so the, both of them were offered that subtly and not so subtly, repeatedly. Um, and they were really offered that in the last months 
before their executions. Judge, Judge Coffin had kind of almost said as much at open court. Um, I think it was Ju both Julius's mother and Ethel's mother visited with Judge Coffin, and he essentially told them they hold, the legal phrase, they hold the key to their cell. They hold the key to the, their own incarceration. In other words, they can confess. Um, and, and he made it more or less clear that he would commute the sentences if they confessed. Um, but uh, leading, it was far more active, the effort to get them to confess leading up to their executions. The, the, they set up wire communications in Sing Sing that were going to the FBI headquarters and the Justice Department in New York. They were doing that right up until the moment of execution. I mean, like minutes and hours before execution. Um, and one of the questions they asked Julius right as almost as he was walking into uh, the chamber that held the electric chair. One of the questions written on their form to ask Julius was, did your wife know of your activities? So think about that. She's about to be executed for taking part in those activities moments after he is, and yet the government's so uncertain of her real guilt that they're asking him to implicate her at the last minute. Um, I, he refused to talk to the government. Yeah, that's a great question. There, there, there were many other such people. Some, some of them were not caught, um, and they've been identified later. Um, but the, the one who was apprehended, who provided much more useful information to the Soviets, because he was an actual physicist. Um, and he, if you've seen the movie Oppenheimer, he has a kind of cameo appearance in Oppenheimer, because he was at Los Alamos for a time also. His name is Klaus Fuchs. And Fuchs was a German physicist who fled, uh, a Marxist who fled Nazi Germany, went to England, worked on uh, the nuclear program starting in England, and then he came to the United States, and he was fairly high up in the sort of hierarchy of scientists there. Um, Fuchs was exposed by the Venona Project. They went, he was in England then, still in England. They went to Fuchs, confronted him with the evidence of his participation, he immediately confessed, and that's when dominoes began to fall in the United States, um, and the members of the conspiracy in the U.S. were apprehended, including Julius. So what do you think led Yeah, I, I mean, to answer the question about the Rosenbergs, the Rosenbergs were, were deeply committed communists. Um, and they had been much earlier in their lives, um, through school and out of school. Um, and the opportunity came to, you know, to, to do something about it. Um, and not just go to meetings, and not just talk about it, not just, they used to get the Daily Worker, and when they, they started, which was the communist newspaper in New York, when they, when they uh, started actual espionage, they stopped their subscription to the, to the Daily Worker. So because they didn't want to attract suspicion, it was sort of a sign that they had moved into real uh, you know, assistance rather than just kind of passive belief. Um, so that's, that's the best explanation. They, they also, you know, we don't really know exactly why they, what they did. They, they wrote letters to each other um, in prison, in Sing Sing, and those letters were later published by their sons. Um, so you might, try to glean, you know, of course they don't admit their guilt to those letters, they maintain their innocence to their deaths, but they do talk about their beliefs. Um, but the letters aren't terribly reliable because they, they read almost like propaganda and, and they're, they're a weird combination of personal endearments because they were in this tragic situation in prison together in the same place but in separate wings. Um, there's a lot of, it, it's heartbreaking to read those letters, but, but then a lot of it just reads like communist propaganda because they knew it was gonna be published um, as, it, as it was. Um, so they might have been animated to some degree by a belief that, as many people held, that the United States should not have a nuclear monopoly. You know, there were a lot of people, including scientists, and again, this is talked about in Oppenheimer, who, who thought that it's dangerous in the world for only one government to have this unique um, control of this technology should be shared. Um, so that, that might have been it. Of course, it was somewhat extenuating for them that the Soviets were a wartime ally you know, when they passed this information to Russia, Russia was an ally of the United States. They, they tried to make that argument when they wanted a reduced sentence. Um, 
and it, it, you know, to my mind, it, it has some appeal, has some force. Um, so, but beyond that, it's just sort of guesswork why, why they would do that. I, I guess the last thing I would say is they, it would have been legitimate for them, um, and, and this was expressed by the brother, David Greenglass, who turned a witness for the prosecution who testified. Um, it, it probably would have been legitimate to believe that they would never face these kinds of severe consequences. Maybe they thought if we're caught, well, they seem to think if we're caught, we'll flee, and they tried to flee, but maybe they thought if that doesn't work, you know, we'll, we'll be in prison for a while, but we'll get out. And that, that would have been a not unreasonable thing to think, but, but they, the moment they were tried and sentenced in 1951 was probably the worst possible time for somebody like them to go on trials. The middle of the Korean War, and, and the, the Red Scare is underway and getting worse, and it, it just, none of that was true in 1945 when they committed the espionage. So they might have been trapped that way. Yeah. Yeah. Who were, first of all, who raised the children? And secondly, what was their mental health just to cope with this? Yeah, so yeah, so the question is who what it was a question about the Rosenberg's children. The, the Rosenberg's children were I think eight and ten or seven and nine, something like that, when, at the time of the execution. They were very young. Um, and so she asked who raised them and what were the repercussions for them you know, emotionally just growing up with this legacy. So they were raised by a guy named Abel Muirpol, um, and I forget Abel Muirpol's wife's name, but it's a couple. Um, and Muirpol was a teacher, ironically, at the same high school that Irving Kaufman went to in New York. He was a music teacher at DeWitt Clinton High School in New York, and he's famous for writing a, a famous song, um, which is Strange Fruit, the, the anti-lynching song, Billie Holiday, if I'm yeah, really correct, is the one who famously recorded it. Yeah. Um, that, that, Abel Mirpol on the side was a songwriter, and he wrote that song. But secretly, Mirpol was also a communist, and Mirpol felt, as, as many did, of course, um, the tremendous you know, anxiety for these children and, and feeling for them. Rosenberg family members were not, did not step forward quite immediately to take in those two children. They were, uh, they were, yeah, they were sort of shunted around among the family and also in, in protective, you know, essentially an orphanage in New York City. Um, the Rosenberg family was sort of reeling from this and, and shock and, of course, ashamed, I guess, at some level. Um, and so the kids ended up with the Muirpoles. And, and they, what they've said since is that the Muirpoles were, it was a great situation for them. The Muirpoles were loving parents. Um, uh, and just, you know, it was the best that you could make out of such a typical scenario. Um, so they grew up, and then they, um, the, their last names are, they took the name Mirapol, and that's the names they have today. They became academics, and they were in Massachusetts, uh, I think they still are, one's in New York. Um, and in, they were kind of out of sight, um, but in the late 1960s, they decided to sort of go public. It's kind of a long story why they did that, but they decided to go public and they launched this campaign. So they announced to the world sort of who they were, and they launched this campaign to clear their parents' name, and it was extremely effective. They, they were you know, smart, articulate spokesmen for this cause, um, and they, uh, went over, you know, it was a perfect time to be making these arguments in the wake of the dissolution of Vietnam and Watergate, and they, they went around the country, um, and they kind of revitalized a, a national protest movement, almost, that centered on the Rosenbergs in the early 50s and then died down. Um, so just the last part of your question, like what were the effects on them? They, they've written about that, you know, quite eloquently. Um, over the years, they've written several books, they've written a lot of articles, they've talked about how incredibly difficult that experience was, the loss of parents who they were at an age to remember, you know. Yeah, felt abandoned, um, conflicting feelings of, Abandonment and, of course, you know, despising the government. Um, and just, just, you know, difficult, quite difficult. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, I have this vague recollection that uh, the execution was moved up a few hours, so it would not take place on the shots. Yes, that was a classic. And, and, yeah. And I just wondered, who was behind that? And why? That, that was a classic cough. Right, so the question is, he, he's, he was asking, he said he had a vague recollection that the, the uh, executions were actually moved up 
so that they wouldn't happen on the Sabbath. Um, and that's correct. It was a classic coffin to figure out a solution to a problem, but not the one that the people were sort of asking for, one that suited him a little better. Because uh, he was anxious for these executions to happen. He was, he was, his family had fled their apartment. They were at the Connecticut estate of a guy named Lou Rosensteel, who was a kind of liquor magnate of that period, and a family friend. Um, he was living alone, surrounded by the FBI. He, he, all in the months before the uh, executions, he was pressuring the government to speed it up, do what it could to speed this up uh, behind the scenes. Um, so the executions were scheduled for a Friday evening. Um, but then the Rosenberg's lawyers and others um, you know, protested that it, that mean they were going to be executed on Shabbat. Um, and that complaint was brought to Judge Kaufman. He said, oh, we'll work that out. Don't worry. And, and what everybody assumed that meant was that they were going to be executed the following Sunday. That they would have a, that the children were going to be brought to the prison and be able to say goodbye to their parents. And they were going to have one more visit there um, and two more days of life. Um, and instead, the execution was moved forward um, and took place right, just truly minutes uh, before sundown on a Friday evening in June of 1953. What's your impression of the Rosenberg's attorney, Manuel Block? Uh, so the question is, what is my impression of the Rosenberg's attorney, Manuel, uh, Manuel Block, was their attorney? And, and I, I think he, he didn't do a great job, and, and I think I think it was a combination of being handed a really difficult case and a really bad set of cards and then not playing them all that well. Um, he made certain strategic errors in the courtroom. Um, for example, there was a, a key moment of the trial where the government was going to, uh, the government was in a weird box because they, they wanted to put this case on trial, they wanted to talk about the atomic bomb, and most of that information was secret. Um, so they didn't want to expose it to the public, and yet every defendant has a Sixth Amendment right to a public trial. So they were the government was constantly trying to figure out how to how to do this, how to straddle that line. Um, and there came a moment where experts were going to testify, and they were going to show the sketch that David Greenglass had written of the, this component of the atomic bomb. Um, and Emmanuel Block immediately. Um, sort of solved the government's problem for it by standing up and saying, Your Honor, you know, we as patriotic Americans, we don't want to jeopardize this. We, we urge you to clear the courtroom uh, of all of any spectators. Um, and that, the government was really happy with that because they weren't sure how to, how to deal with this and they thought it would be an issue on appeal uh, that these guys were entitled to a public trial. Um, so it was a weird concession to the government and it, had, it was damaging because what it conveyed to the jury was, this is really important. Whereas a key part of the defense should have been, none of this information is really important. The Soviets developed the bomb on their own. This, you know, even if it went to the Soviets, this is this guy's a machinist with a meager education. He could not have transmitted key atomic information to the Soviets. <laughs> that that had to be a key feature of any defense, and he sort of fatally compromised this with this dramatic moment where he agreed and proposed clearing the courtroom for this lens mold sketch. I mean, that's one example. That they're they're. He, he couldn't. He couldn't get very far. They didn't have a lot of information about what the Rosenbergs were really charged with. They didn't have any witnesses. The, the only witnesses who testified for them were Ethel and Julius Rosenberg. By all accounts, they made a kind of poor impression. Um, I say that because later in the 1970s, a reporter tracked down the jurors and interviewed them, which was great. That was sort of, you know, otherwise not known what they would have thought other than their verdict. Um, it was a really interesting article, and they all said, "Oh, they didn't believe a thing that came out of the Rosenberg." So, it, it, I don't know that any lawyer could have gotten them off. I don't think he could have or she could have, but he didn't do a great job. Um, one more? Yeah. Uh, one more? Yeah. 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 Yeah, it, well, it would not have been, it would have been improper. Yeah. Yeah, so the question is, I think the question is, hypothetically, if Judge Kaufman had known about their guilt through the Winona transcripts beforehand, should or could he have reflected that in his decision making? And, and the answer is that would have been unethical. He, 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 if, if, the government, if, Roy, if what Roy Cohn said in that article about knowing himself of the Winona transcripts and telling that to Judge Kaufman before the trial, if that's true, then that would have been highly unethical. It's already unethical for them to be talking during the trial anyway. 
But, but to give that kind of information to prejudice the judge with secret information that nobody else had um, before the trial, that, that would have been highly improper. So if it happened, that would certainly improper. I, I, yeah, well, maybe, yeah. maybe so. There, there was no mercy. But that's, that's it. We've talked extensively about the Rosenberg case. That's, I guess the point of the book and the second half of the book is there was a lot of mercy for a lot of other people, just not the Rosenberg case. So I will tell you that the interesting tidbits, the history, the details that you part are just fascinating for the book. And the book really does read the way that Martin is speaking today. Fascinating read. It reads like a novel, and I highly recommend the book because you've really just gotten the very tip of the iceberg today. And I highly recommend that you take the time to read the whole thing. Um, thank you so much for being here.